So thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Ashby Kinch. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean of the Graduate School. On the way in, you met uh, a few people that I want to thank right off the bat. Uh, Mike Morelli in the business uh, school business runs the event management program. Uh, students from his event management class, is that right, uh, are with us today, and that's Corey. Uh, Brandon couldn't be here today. Ken Jones and Patrick Yoder. And they've been really helpful in uh, pulling the event together. Other groups that have, have helped out in the organization and promotion are Humanities Institute, Gillian Glaze, and Alex helped uh, create a, a poster on campus and did some PR. Um, the Institute of Health and Humanities, Amy Rado Parks and Board, uh, sponsored the food. Um, and, uh, and then the graduate school, the reason we got involved is that Graduate school wants to play a role on this campus of bringing to light and visibility issues that cut across the whole community, whether that's the university community or the community of Western Montana. So nothing kind of uh, speaks out universality and interdisciplinarity and the need to think across boundaries uh, than the topic of death, dying, and grief. So I've pulled this uh, panel together. These are colleagues of mine that I've worked with off and on for a couple of years in various ways, as well as some people um, that I just got to know recently, in fact, just met for the first time tonight uh, in one case. Um, but this, it's an amazing group of people um, who work on these issues, both in their research, uh, in their art, um, and then, of course, in their direct delivery and engagement with um, end-of-life care and end-of-life uh, spiritual care uh, in the community. So my thought was I would introduce them uh, to you at the beginning, and then they're going to come up, and each of them are going to talk for a short period of time. Then we're going to have a broader uh, panel discussion open to questions. Um, panelists may ask one another questions. There'll be, I'm sure, important themes that run through uh, each of the presentations that we'll want to think about as a group. Um, and uh, that's about it. Does that sound good? Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're glad to see uh, so many of you here. So immediately to my right, we have Greg Gallo from uh, Open Way uh, Sangha. And he's also the chaplain of Hospice of Missoula. Uh, then we have Rabbi Mark Kula from UM Hillel and Congregation Beth Shalom in Bozeman. Then we have Shandine P, professor uh, at Salish Kootenai College. Uh, we have Bernadette Sweeney, uh, who will provide a kind of break in the middle. It'll be great. She's a professor of theater here at UM. Uh, then we have Kimber McKay, professor of anthropology, Ruth Vanita, professor of English, and Shalom Kristana Graha from Indonesia, a graduate student in environmental philosophy. Thank you all for uh, being here uh, to talk and listen to this, this topic. It's wonderful for you to make the effort to to be here, to learn, to explore, and um, and especially as Ashby said, you know, this uh, topic of death and dying is something that all of us face and all of us uh, will encounter and have encountered. Um, just uh, very, very briefly, I would like to mention that uh, although I am the uh, hospice uh, chaplain for Hospice of Missoula, um, you know, I don't just serve Buddhist patients. Uh, chaplains, in general, serve people of all faiths and traditions. And so today, I'll be wearing more of my Buddhist hat, the Open Way Sangha tradition, uh, where I ordained into uh, that tradition in the early 2000s. Um, and I just also wanted to acknowledge that uh, when Ashby invited me to speak, I felt a little hesitant to speak as any kind of authority on uh, Buddhist culture uh, because, as you can see, I'm a white man and I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, uh, which was kind of my culture. So um, what I'm presenting today is what I've learned uh, being ordained in that Buddhist tradition, but I did want to flag that right away, uh, that uh, this is... Um, you know, this is who I am, and so I'm not an authority on uh, cultural Buddhism, but I am a, uh, have a little bit of understanding on an aspect of uh, Buddhist culture. So uh, when we talk about Buddhism, there's many different denominations, if you will, many different uh, varieties of Buddhism. Uh, originated in India and spread uh, throughout Asia and into Southeast Asia and eventually into the West. And um, 
as Buddhism uh, travels from country to country and culture to culture, it adopts parts of that culture. And those become absorbed into the tradition. So, for example, a Japanese Zen tradition is going to be very different from a Thai uh, Theravadan tradition or from a Tibetan Buddhist tradition or from uh, the Buddhism that we find in the United States and in Europe and in other parts of North America. Um, Tibetan Buddhists in particular have a very elaborate uh, end-of-life uh, ritual and end-of-life practices. Uh, the Buddhism that I was ordained into is a Vietnamese Zen tradition, so I'll speak a little bit uh, more from that uh, perspective. Um, the fundamental uh, teachings of Buddhism are the Four Noble Truths, uh, the idea that suffering exists in the world, that there is um, a cause of that suffering. There's also an end to that suffering. And then the fourth truth is that there is a path that a person can follow to end that suffering. Um, one of um, the unavoidable sufferings that the Buddha identified actually prior to being the Buddha, uh, he was a very... Uh, pampered and um, coddled uh, prince. And so he ventured out into the town one day when no one knew he was going to be there, so they couldn't clean everything up. And he was able to see uh, an ill person, uh, somebody who was very sick. Uh, he was able to see an old person that had been, uh, age had been kept from him, the fact that we all age. And he also saw a corpse. Uh, and these three aspects, uh, he considered kind of unavoidable and part of the human condition. Uh, so death has been a very uh, integral part of Buddhist practice. There's been um, many teachings about contemplating uh, our own death, uh, our own uh, body's decomposition, our own decay. Um, and uh, this aspect of contemplating death, uh, the idea is to lead a person away from uh, being attached to uh, the body, to have an experience not just of um, an awareness of our mortality, but actually an experience of uh, the impermanence of everything around us, of our bodies, of our families, of our uh, cities, of our cultures of our societies. Um, and in that uh, contemplation of death, uh, there's an invitation to start to see ourselves as being part of um, something larger, so that our body is made up of all things that are not our body. Uh, so um, when we look at, um, we hear the adage, you are what you eat. Uh, well, that's actually literal. Uh, if you don't eat, you don't live. And so our bodies become our food. It becomes what we take in through our senses, what we take in through our uh, thoughts, what we take in through our mouths. Um, and we start to uh, develop an understanding that uh, we, as an individual, uh, we're not separate from anything else. Uh, so those contemplations of not being separate combined with the contemplation of uh, impermanence, that everything's constantly changing, uh, can lead us to a, a freedom, a liberation, uh, what's in uh, Buddhist literature called nirvana, or uh, um, ease in the world. Um, and Buddhism uh, talks um, mostly about experience and practice, uh, something that I think uh, we'll probably hear from some of the other uh, panelists. Uh, it's a, a tradition that the idea of non-self isn't taught as just an idea. It's taught as a practice, as a way of experiencing the world. Uh, likewise with the idea of impermanence. Um, and these, uh, these practices then help us understand both life and death. Um, 
So death, in a certain sense, in the Buddhist tradition, is seen as just a continuation of life. It's seen as, a, uh, I heard one Buddhist teacher describe it as, you know, we don't fear the void that we come from uh, before we are born. So why do we fear the void that we go to after we die? It's just another extension of our uh, being. Um, and we can use death as a tool uh, to become more unafraid, more fearless, uh, and more present. Um, because if everything is impermanent, uh, why waste our time uh, fighting? And why waste our time uh, arguing and hating when we have these wonderful, amazing miracles in front of us all of the time? Um, and I will say just one brief thing about uh, grief, because uh, I, told, I warned Ashby that if you put a quarter in me, I would keep going, so I'm going to rein myself in. But I did want to talk about uh, this idea of grief in Buddhism. And there's a wonderful story uh, where um, a woman uh, named uh, Kisa Gotami uh, had a child that died, and she was completely bereft. And so everyone said, oh, go talk to the Buddha. He, will, uh, he can heal your child. So she carried uh, her child's body to the Buddha and just made this plea to him that he would uh, revive her child. And he said that uh, before he could do anything, he needed her to go gather a handful of mustard seeds from a family that had not been touched by grief. Uh, so she went to the village and knocked on each door and asked, have you been touched by grief? And every family she encountered uh, was unable to say that they hadn't been touched. In other words, every family had been touched by uh, death. Every family had been touched by loss. Uh, and what happened to her as she went throughout the day, uh, her grief continued. Uh, that extreme painful uh, experience of the death of her child continued, but it became part of a larger context. She felt connected uh, to the community around her. And she realized that she wasn't alone in her grief, that the, uh, every one of us is experiencing that and has experienced that, and that united us. And it was able to uh, heal her heart a little bit in that uh, she was able to feel connected to the people around her. Uh, so to, to summarize, um, Buddhism takes a very practical approach uh, to death, uh, sees it as both a teacher and as an inev inevitability, uh, that we're also interconnected, that we're all experiencing this and will experience this, and that um, grief touches all of us. And just to demonstrate that as enlightened as a Buddhist might be about uh, his or her experience of um, of that fearlessness of death. There was a, a Tibetan teacher, um, Master Marpa, uh, who had a child that died as well. And all of his students asked him, why are you so sad? You've taught us that life is impermanent and that everything's an illusion anyway, that, this is, uh, that we're living in this dream. And uh, the Tibetan master said, that is all true. He said, and Losing a child is one of the saddest illusions that there is. Um, so though a Buddhist perspective might offer some healing, uh, it doesn't take away that pain of grief. It just provides a way of looking at it. Uh, it's, it provides a way of putting it into a context and provides a way of healing. So thank you. I want to say hello to everyone and shalom. I already feel better. It's great to be on this panel with uh, so many wise and kind people to discuss this topic. And I want to thank Ashby for the invitation. Uh, now I understand why he only gave me a dime. Because <laughs> all of us could speak on and on about this topic. And um, I'm privileged to talk about the Jewish perspective on death and grieving and mourning. And Judaism is very much aware of the life cycle that we go through. Birth, coming of age, intimate relationships, the breaking up of relationships, illness, and death. 
As we go through those stages, they're actually the most traumatic aspects of life. When things are kind of status quo, we don't have to deal with too much, we keep going. But then we hit those challenges of transitions. And Judaism has created rituals for those transition periods. When a child grows up and becomes a young adult, puberty, that change of stage of life, when one develops an intimate and close bond, a commitment, marriage, that is a shift in our lives, and Judaism has rituals for that. And when life ends, when someone dies, Judaism has rituals. So I'll share some of those particular rituals as part of Jewish custom. Um, <clears throat> Judaism is well recognized that the life cycle, it is good to be alive. That is the preference. But we know that life ends. And the body stops functioning, but there is an interior part of a person called the soul, and that continues to exist. So you can actually just close your eyes for a moment, think of someone who's passed away, and you can feel their presence. That's an element of soulfulness that continues to exist. I can do it, I can think of my parents who passed away, my father four years ago. I can feel his presence. When I close my eyes, I think of experiences and moments and interchanges. I feel his presence. So at the end of a life, there is an element in Jewish practice called the vidui, or a confessional, where you come to terms with your life. And there, is, there are parables in Jewish literature. The most uh, well-known body of Jewish literature is called the Talmud. A multi-volume set, probably 30 volumes, compiled, edited, canonized in the year 5600 of the Common Era. And it documents discussions and conversations Law, L-A-W, and lore, L-O-R-E, and stories. And one of them is, you know, we come to this, uh, someone ends, his life is over and comes before God, and God says, so, were you like the famous Rabbi Akiva? And he says, uh, no, no, I wasn't like him. Were you like, did you model yourself after, after like King David? Uh, no. And then God says, did you live up to and model yourself in the best of who you are. And the person starts crying. He says, oh, that was the hardest part to be me. So we come to the end of life and we come to terms with our journey. And there are, there's a ceremony for that. <clears throat> and many times it does happen, but it, the final line we should say in according to Jewish custom is I am one with the world and I believe in life. The Shema Yisrael. When a person uh, passes, the body is watched and never left alone. There might have been some practical reasons in the ancient world why a body was watched over and not left alone. This symbolic and more meaningful approach is that we respect a deceased body. And we care for the body. There's a special way of washing and preparing the body for burial. It's called tahara, meaning holiness. And uh, preparing the body, the person is According to the range of Jewish customs, <clears throat> there's a range of Jewish customs, and uh, some of Jewish custom involves being buried in a shroud, not your best suit or dress, but a shroud. Um, it's kind of like a white tunic. <clears throat> and then there is the um, Jewish custom has burial taking place as soon as possible. I'm sure that was practical from the ancient world as well. You didn't want a deceased body just being around. And so within it, there's a custom of within 24 hours of doing a burial. Of course, there are realities that we have to take into consideration in the modern world. People live across the country, and there are other you know, sensitivities and sensibilities that are considered. Um, general Jewish practice is burial. In more contemporary communities, and people do in, um, practice cremation. There were some uncomfortable connotations of cremation in the Jewish world, uh, most contemporary after the Holocaust, because Jews were cremated and, uh, in the crematorium in, in uh, Germany and the concentration camps. 
and it was in other ritual that other cultures followed. So Judaism as a respecting sign of the body. The body was buried so that reflecting the biblical verse, we go from dust to dust. We go back to the earth where we are elements. We come from the earth and we go back to the earth. And the soul continues to exist in the greater spheres of what we believe is the non-physical world. The olam haba, the next world. At the funeral service, a, uh, uh, we participate in the burial process where one is put in the ground and we take the earth and participate in the burial. There's a profound sense of finality when you hear that dirt or the earth hit the casket in the ground and to watch the casket be lowered. You really feel the transition from being alive to no longer being physically present. Following the uh, <clears throat> funeral, there was a period called Shiva, a seven-day mourning period, like uh, for a week. I like to think of the imagery of the creation story, the biblical narrative. The world was created in seven days as a, as a paradigm. And so we take leave of the person who's passed over a seven-day period as well. People observe different customs. Sometimes they'll observe two days of this morning period of being at home. And people come to visit the person at home. And the community takes care of a person who is going through that mourning process. We'll bring food over to the house. We'll take care of the person because one is in mourning. And that is a painful part of life when we lose a loved one. That's a seven-day period. Then there's a 30-day period, like that first month. You know, when we lose someone, there's the ups and downs. Sometimes you don't even think about it, and then you feel guilty. Oh, my God, I didn't think about it today. Or I didn't think about it for an hour. The you know, ups and downs, when we oh, I'm going to be okay. Oh, I'm weeping. You know, over that cup of coffee in the morning, you just start crying as you realize the loss you've experienced. So a very important concept is, as a community is to help the person who's mourning go through the process is to bring comfort to the person who's mourning. And literally we say comfort to the bereaved. And that is the language that we use. You know, sometimes you see someone who has lost a loved one, you don't even know what to say. So Judaism has a phrase. You're not sure what to say, here's something you could say. May you know comfort or comfort to the bereaved. And may your memories be for a blessing. Then there's the yearly anniversary of remembering a loved one. It's the Yortzeit. It's like a German, German word. The yearly date of a person's passing. Judaism doesn't remember a person's birth date after they pass. Jewish culture and practice is to remember the person on the day they passed. You might ask why. You should ask why of everything we're saying. Because we remember all the accomplishments and what a person's done in life. And as cute as a baby is, they haven't accomplished too much yet, besides coming through the birth canal. So we don't remember, we don't celebrate the birthday after a person has passed, but the day of their passing. And we do that every year. And then four times during the year, we have a Yisker ceremony, remembering a, a selection of prayers and psalms to remember a loved one. Because in a sense, there's a continuity from this world to the next world. We know there's much more to our existence than just our physical being. We know value systems and ideas. They're not tangible. They're concepts where we believe that they exist. Truth. I mean, I can't hand you truth on a platter. But I know it exists. Nice talking to you. I know it exists. I know it exists. So in many ways, it's like a window from this world to the next world. And when we have that Yisker service, you may have heard of the Day of Atonement, one of the holiest days of the year on the Jewish calendar. And during that day, we do hold a memorial service. And we begin to think about our loved ones. And in some ways, that window between this world and whatever exists where our souls are present, where after we are physically no longer present. We can have that connection. When someone dies, we just don't automatically forget them and they disappear. In fact, it's quite the contrary. 
when someone dies, they're not physically present. But the greatness of who they were and are continues to be part of our being. And we can call on that presence. And that is done four times a year as part of the, um, the liturgy, the prayers. Um, and then Judaism recognizes that uh, there is brokenness in the world. And that brokenness is connected with our wholeness. So we don't deny death's existence. We don't try to avoid it. But it's incorporated into life's journey. As a culture in America, we have to do a better job of that. We try not to talk about too much. We've neutered the process. We've kind of hands off. But we have to incorporate it into the process of living. And I, um, Judaism says that uh, our lives are a gift. And we have to celebrate life and be there for one another. And then we know there's purpose and meaning. And that life is a journey. And when it physically comes to an end, we have a process. And we have rituals and mitzvot, actual deeds to help us through that process. Thank you. So I had an um, English teacher in high school. And um, so we'd come into class and ask him various questions. But some of the uh, um, more popular questions would be, well, how did I do on my test? Or um, when is this test due? What is my grade like? And um, a common response by the, the English teacher was, was generally, well, you know, you're, you're only guaranteed two things in life. And those things are death and taxes. Yes, death and taxes. So who has paid taxes in this room? Raise your hand. Of course you have. Who has died in this room? Not many of us. <laughs> we don't know too much about it. We don't know what happens after uh, that thing occurs. Um, but it leads me to uh, a couple of things in my life growing up. Um, mostly these assumptions that I make, um, because in a way I've been uh, isolated in my idea of what death and mourning is. Um, I grew up in Arley, Montana. Um, from the uh, Salish people there, and um, death is, um, just like in any community, a continual event. It happens monthly. So growing up as a young child, being involved in all these uh, different uh, um, happenings of death, uh, I, I couldn't see outside of that. So um, my, my father was was adopted as a young child, and he was raised by a, a non-native person. And um, this person was, was considered like a grandparent to me. So when um, he got to the age where he was nearing his end of life and um, eventually passed away, I was an adult. So I attended the funeral, and he was a Catholic person. And, and so we, we go to the church, and it was really, um, the church is not too foreign to, to most native folks. But the, 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 the manner of taking care of this death was really different for me. And um, I was very thrown off by the process that was happening. Um, most striking about it was two things. Number one was the graveside manner that occurred at that particular funeral. So the casket was put over the, the hole and... Um, the priest said a prayer. This is from my memory. probably not exactly accurate to what happened. But, um, and then after the priest was done praying, everybody shuffled off. Except me and my brothers and my family were, were waiting. Well, aren't we going to fill this grave in? Aren't we going to lower the casket? And do all these things that we, we were accustomed to doing. So it made me stop and think, okay, this, this is, a, this is a, I, I've really been isolated and I don't understand these other manners of death, which is fine. Um, so then we continue on to back to the church where they said, well, we're going to have a meal. I'm accustomed to that because after the death of a person, the family puts on a big feed to feed everybody um, to help the person in their last, um, their last passage way to the place that they have to go. So we go to the, 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 uh, back to the church to eat, and um, we're accustomed to this, this huge meal that has been prepared, prepared for over, over four days and it was uh, cheese and crackers. And, and I'm like, okay, well, that's all right. I, I mean, it's, 
it's food, you know, we're, we're okay. So it got me to thinking about this idea of death and mourning, and um, it makes me think about uh, just this human, this humanness that we have about ourselves. And you all do it, we all do it. But I like to use this example, and if you didn't grow up on a res or near the res, maybe you don't get it, but maybe you will. So Indians, we're practical people, and just like anybody else, we do things that are very practical. So I say, um, when a car breaks down, yeah, I mean, maybe different people handle it in a different way, sell it off, junk it out, give it away. But Indians, we keep those, because that's not a broke down car, by golly. That's a, sh that's a shed. That's a storage shed. You can put stuff in it. Yeah, so it, it's weatherproof and those kind of things. So anyway, so, um, so death is very practical. It's very practical, but if you're trying to describe it to someone outside who's never seen it, you might think, why are they doing that? That's crazy. That's crazy. Maybe. I mean, because I had thought that. I thought, well, we're, we're, we need to do these things because my grandparent here needs to make his journey to to this um, place that I envision people going. So one of the, the things that um, also struck me is, so um, my, my young children went to a, um, a child care. It was an, a non-native person. And we frequently had to come get our kids to go to a funeral or bring them there while we go to a funeral. And, and she was just struck how, how often we had to do this. It was on a monthly basis. And she said, I've only been to one funeral in my whole life. And in the time I've watched your children in these three years, you've been to at least 25 to 30 funerals. And so it was very striking to me to think about that. And then um, to also connect back to um, my grandparents' passing, where that there is an obvious difference in the way we approach death. None's neither good nor bad, but different. So um, some of the things that I started to consider was, well, okay, if I had to look back at my own upbringing, what, what is the practical purpose of some of these things? Because I have to be able to explain that for other people to understand. So one of the things that are um, that is practiced is um, during the death, the, the, the wake, there's a three-day period of awake. And during that time, we consider that person to be alive and still present with us. So we do things such as when we are eating our meals during this wake time, we also make a plate for the dead, put it next to them, mainly toward their head area. And then when everybody's done eating, that food goes out to, to somewhere for someone to pray upon. And so the connection between the practical purpose is that this person, um, this person has to make a, a, a journey in that short time. And if they don't receive enough prayers Maybe they were kind of bad in their life at some point, or maybe they just need a little extra push. If they don't get those prayers, then they will end up wandering for an extended period of time on this earth, searching for some way to make it to um, what we believe as this road, this road that travels to the head of our Creator. And that road you guys see every day, I see every day. Well, I see it at night. It's the Milky Way. That's the road that our ancestors travel on. All those stars we see are the, the foot, footprints and the fireplaces of our elders and our ancestors making, our, making their way to the uh, place of our creator. So to aid them on that journey then, it takes a great deal of prayer and a great deal of uh, suffering by the family to um, achieve that goal. Um, so one of the things that happens in this morning or this wake period is, of course, you've got to feed the dead person. And there's someone that is always there with the deceased. And they're typically a person of the same age and of the same sex. And they have to be there continually. And someone has to stay up uh, all night with that person. So that's one of the things that helps this person make that journey toward that, um, that place they need to go. Some of the things that have kind of died off now because they're very, very hard to do is, is um, after the person is buried, uh, the mourning period is a very, very challenging and difficult endeavor. In the old way, the person would cut their hair and they would wear the same clothes for a period of time, up to a year. So they would allow themselves to get very dirty. They would never comb or fix their hair. 
Um, if it was their spouse that passed away, they would have to live with their in-laws. And so people would have to care for this person. Um, food, everything, they would have to provide for that person for a period of one year. Um, and the marker of the end of this mourning period was decided by a couple of things. Um, number one, the in-laws could free them from their suffering by um, looking at certain signs. Another way to tell if someone was done with their mourning period is uh, actually one of their um, best horses, the tail was cut, or the, the tail hair was cut, and when that hair grew all the way back, they were released from their mourning period. But all this is done in an effort to help that deceased person to make their journey. But not only that, if we think back about the practical, the practical side of this, um, if we think about a death that we've had in our own lives, and we reflect back on um, our experience and, and how do we get rid of that uh, or how do we process that really hard, hard emotion of death? There has to be some process in your own way so you don't keep carrying that year after year after year because in the end, we have to work, we have to move forward in our time on earth. So these things are, were very practical. So that's the question I would have to ask the audience and ask all our panelists, how in your own culture do you define the end of your mourning period? When do you feel like this is done being hurt and you can move on? You can still remember, and what are those steps inside of that process that allow you to do that? Because in my way, there were some very specific ways and also some very cautionary steps to ensure that no one else followed that person in death. I don't know about anybody else's um, particular cultural ways, but in our way, we, we tend to see this pattern of death following death, and it usually happens in groups of three. That's not normal, but we notice it, it. And the reason why it's not normal is because, and this is just what I think, because we have lost that process of grieving We've, we've subjugated some of our ways to another way that's not quite suited to our worldview. So, as an example, uh, in, in my final concluding comments here, when the body is being taken to the grave site, in the old way, the people led the body to the grave site. But nowadays, we typically see that happen the other way around. Everybody parades with the body in the front. So the old people say, that body is looking back at all those people saying, okay, I want to take you, and I want to take you, and I want to take you with me. That's a practical thing, because that person is still alive. It's, it's a very traumatic event. Maybe they don't know what's going on. They want to take people with them, some loved ones with them. And also, if they don't get enough prayers in that time, maybe they'll grab someone they know that's really good, that's been good in life to bring with them, to make them pass so that they can journey with them to ensure that they get to the place that they need to go. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Bernadette Sweeney, as Ashby mentioned. I'm professor of theater here at the University of Montana. I'm Irish, I'm an Irish native. I moved here uh, roughly 10 years ago. And I, uh, one of my research specializations is in, obviously, performance and aspects of performance in the Irish theater tradition. The Irish theater Theatre tradition is very rich. Um, uh, it has a very clear relationship, not just to Ireland as a predominantly Catholic country with all of the rituals that come with that, but also uh, uh, looks back to uh, a pre-Christian ritual. And those combined rituals become part of the performativity of the Irish culture. Um, Ashby said that I was going to give you all a break as the theatre professor. I'm not quite so sure that the content is light enough for that, but um, we'll see. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce a grad student in the MFA program, Ellie Catarasano, who's going to read um, with, uh, for me, um, some extracts from Riders to the Sea. Uh, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit to that first before she performs for us. Um, so, uh, Ireland's culture is a very performative culture, and it's rich, obviously, in, um, in tradition, and it gives us an arts heritage that is very literary, um, but also very performative, as I've said. And the theatre tradition combines both of those elements, and has done, um, particularly um, since the foundation of the Irish National Theatre 
um, the Abbey Theatre in 1904. Um, but the reason why it is so rich and performative is because it can reach back to these um, cultural uh, phenomena, if you like. And it's, it's really interesting to me as a, as a foreigner in America to listen to you speak about the Indian traditions of death and to realize how many of them are familiar to me. Um, and I think there's some really interesting parallels, not least of what we do with our cars when we're done with them. Um, but there are many uh, superstitions and traditions around death, um, and these have been staged by many different playwrights and incorporated into their works, people like um, Brian Friel and John Millington Singh. So John Millington Singh wrote this play called Riders to the Sea, which was first performed in 1904. Um, and this play includes aspects of pagan Irish tradition that became kind of appropriated or at least accommodated by the Catholic Church, but that continued to be part of the burial rituals, um, even to an extent up to this day. Uh, one of these traditions is quina, the Irish word for crying, or keening being its English translation. And this is a tradition that was documented by um, Singh when he went to the Aran Islands off the West Coast um, uh, to do some immersive research into funeral traditions. Um, he described Quina as the following. The women sat down among the flat tombstones bordered with a pale fringe of early bracken and began the wild keen or crying for the dead. Each old woman as she took her turn in the leading recitative seemed possessed for the moment with a profound ecstasy of grief, swaying to, a to and fro and bending her forehead to the stone before her while she called out to the dead with a perpetually recurring chant of sobs. All around the graveyard, other wrinkled women, looking out from under the deep red petticoats that cloaked them, rocked themselves the same rhythm and intoned the inarticulate chant that is sustained by all as an accompaniment. There is an irony in these words of atonement and Catholic belief spoken by voices that were still hoarse with the cries of pagan desperation. Riders to the Sea, as I said, first produced in 1904, evokes a frugal and elemental lifestyle set on the Aran Islands on one of them, presumed to be Inish man, uh, off the West Coast. It is a play about loss. The mother, Moira, has lost four of her six sons to the sea. Her fifth son, Michael, is missing, feared drowned. And in the course of the action, her sixth son, Bartley, prepares to cross to the mainland, leaving Moira and her two daughters, Kathleen and Nora, behind. At the end of the play, as the drowned Bartley is brought back from the sea to be waked and buried, the keening begins. Uh, and our first extract from Riders to the Sea speaks to that moment. There was Seamus and his father, and his own father again, were lost in a dark night, and not a stick or a sign was seen of them when the sun, when the sun went up. There was Patch, after it was drowned out of a kirk that turned over. I was sitting here with Bartley, and he, baby, lying on my two knees, and I seen two women, and three women, and four women coming in, and they crossing themselves and not saying a word. I looked out then, and there were men coming after them, and they holding the thing in the half of a red sail, and water dripping out of it. It was a dry day, Nora, and leaving a track to the door. She pauses with her hand stretched out towards the door. The door opens softly and women begin to come in, crossing themselves on the threshold and kneeling down in front of the stage with red petticoats over their head. Thank you, Ali. So you can see there, there's a dramatization, even in the stage directions, of this um, ancient tradition of quina or crying. And you can also see how she lists um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very rhythmic way the names of the dead in this moment um, in the play. Moira has gone over and knelt down at the head of the table. The women are keening softly and swaying themselves with a slow movement. Kathleen and Nora kneel at the other end of the table. The men kneel near the door. 
rise, uh, Mora rises, uh, no, raising her head and speaking as if she did not see the people around her. They're all gone now. And there isn't anything more the sea can do to me. I'll have no call now to be up crying and praying when the wind breaks from the south. And you can hear the surf is in the east and the surf is in the west, making a great stir with the two noises. And they hitting one on the other. I'll have no call now to be going down and getting holy water in the dark nights after Samhain. And I won't care what to do, what the way, what way the sea is when the other women will be keening. Give me the holy water, Nora. There's a, a small sup still on the dresser. She drops Michael's clothes across Bartley's feet and sprinkles the holy water over him. It isn't that I haven't prayed for you, Bartley, and the Almighty God. It isn't that I haven't said prayers in the dark night till you wouldn't know what I'd be saying, but it's a great rest I'll have now, and it's time, surely. It's a great rest I'll have now, and great sleeping in the long nights after Samhain. If it's only a bit of wet flour we have to eat, maybe fish that would be stinking. She kneels down again, crossing herself and saying prayers under her breath. So again, here you see the performance of, um, of the death ritual, of the burial, um, or uh, the, the preparing of the body for burial, rather. Um, and also you get a sense, too, of Moira's relief, which I think, again, is really interesting. And it speaks to the performance of grief and to the challenges of, per of the performance of grief. Obviously, this is a very extreme example, a story of, of such extraordinary loss. Um, but there's a surrender to it. Um, on, the, on the part of this character, Moira, which I think is really interesting. In the course of the play, um, uh, word has come of the burial of Michael in the north as, as, um, as we discover that Bartley has also drowned. So in this moment, she is preparing um, the body of one while putting out the clothes of the other. So in a sense, they're being buried together in this last section. Moira puts the empty cup mouth downwards on the table and lays her hands together on Bartley's feet. They're all together this time, and the end has come. May the Almighty God have mercy on Bartley's soul and on Michael's soul and on the souls of Seamus and Patch and Stephen and Sean. She bends her head. And may he have mercy on my soul, Nora, and on the soul of everyone is left living in the world. She pauses, and the keen rises a little more loudly from the women, then sinks away. Michael has a clean burial in the far north by the grace of the Almighty God. Bartley will have a fine coffin out of the white boards and a deep grave, surely. What more can we want than that? No man at all can ever can be living forever, and we must be satisfied. So this is the these are the last words of the play. This is um, Singh's conclusion, if you like, which I think is again a, such a, a powerful statement, and also leaves us with so many questions. No man at all can be living forever, and we must be satisfied. Um, uh, one of the challenges, of course, in performing this play or performing any kind of grief is in how to make it sustainable, um, which is a big challenge for the actors. And it's something that I've been studying here um, uh, as part of my research in, uh, in, in directing a number of plays over the last while, including um, uh, Every Man, for example, um, uh, Romeo and Juliet, which obviously you all know how death features there, um, and um, uh, Summer and Smoke, actually, by Tennessee Williams, another graduate sitting here in the front, David Millslow. Um, performed uh, the character of John Buchanan, who dies offstage, um, uh, but is a character we come, become very close to, and then his death is, 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 is staged in a way um, over the course of, uh, of that play by Tennessee Williams. So one of the challenges, of course, as I've said, is how to work in uh, approaching with the actors a sustainable way to reimagine re and repeat uh, these rituals um, because, again, this is a, an important social commentary as we reflect life back um, to our audiences. Currently, I'm working on a comedy. Um, I'm directing Twelfth Night by um, William Shakespeare. 
um, and uh, there's this lovely th um, exchange in it. Um, Olivia is, is, is mourning the death of her brother and her resident fool, Festy, um, is trying to cheer her up. And uh, um, she's having none of it. She says, take the fool away. And he says um, to Malvolio, yes, take the fool away, speaking to her. And uh, she, she, she chides him and he says, I'll prove to you that you're a fool. I think you're, and I'm paraphrasing, excuse me. I think, you're, um, I think your brother is in hell. And she says, shame on you, my brother is in heaven. And he says, well, then shame on you to be mourning the loss of your brother who's in heaven. Um, so I, I really like that even in the comedies, um, uh, the theatrical canon helps us to, um, to, uh, to come to terms and to repeat the inaction um, of such an important and central social ritual. Thank you, and thank you, Ellie. Ashby, thank you for inviting me. I'm Kimber McKay, and as Ashby mentioned in the introduction, I'm a professor in anthropology, but I'm also a professor in the School of Public and Community Health Sciences. I'm a medical anthropologist, and I work in international development. I've worked in um, East Africa, which is um, going to be the subject of my remarks today, since the late 90s, and I've um, uh, collected some thoughts to share with you today that relate to a very particular problem, which has presented itself to clinicians on the maternity and NICU units of a Bush Hospital where I've been working since the late 90s in that setting. And so this is gonna bridge global health and public health and also medical anthropology, because what I do is um, called applied anthropology, which is connecting the toolkit and the perspectives of social anthropology, in my case, with some of the practical challenges that are facing people in a um, non-academic setting, but um, where our toolkit and perspectives can come in handy. So I'm really struck by the comments of my colleagues today of how much overlap there is in the different traditions that we've heard about, learned about so far, with what I'm gonna be talking about. And in particular, three things stand out. One is the emphasis on suffering and the management of suffering, which is associated with um, grief and grieving. The second is the emphasis that we've heard on uh, rituals and the binding together of communities around grief processes. And the third is the concept of liminality, <clears throat> or a transitional state that mourning puts us in and a belief in an afterworld, which is often dangerous to the living and to be kept away from. And that relates to that liminal state that grieving puts us in, and which is a, an important part of the Ugandan understanding of grieving that I'm gonna share with you today. So the title of my remarks is Grief and Mourning on the Job in Uganda When Cultural and Clinical Expectations Collide. And it, deals with this very practical problem that clinicians on the maternity and NICU um, units are, are facing at this point in time. And um, on the map that you can see behind me, there's a star that um, brings your attention to the central region of Nepal where I've worked um, in uh, what used to be called Lawero District but has been redistricted and now is called Nakaseki District. If um, you know about uh, Ugandan history, you will know that um, Uganda uh, achieved independence from the British in 1962, and its first president was Milton Obote. Obote was deposed and reinstated um, across this, uh, the next couple of decades, and he was his um, principal foe was the infamous Idi Amin. When um, uh, he last achieved power, took power back from Idi Amin. Um, he was then faced with a rebel uh, movement that was launched from Luero District, where I work, uh, during the late 1970s and up into the mid-80s. So during that period, Obote and the, and the present-day president of Uganda, Uero Museveni, were duking it out. And the um, insurrection was launched from Luero District, which is now referred to sometimes as the Luero Triangle. So um, this photograph that appears behind me is um, from the Getty image that was published in the Boston Globe, which was a common site 
when I started working in the district, um, even uh, 10, 13 years after, um, after Museveni took power, the district itself was still sort of plagued by the, the memories of the genocide that occurred in that district when both the rebel soldiers as well as Obote's army were massacring people. Um, uh, the rebels themselves would put on the clothes and the uniforms of the army by day and um, then would infiltrate people's homes at night wearing their normal clothing and people were just caught in the crossfire. So when I came into the district in the late 90s, this memory was still fresh on people's minds. And so at the time I was um, in my mid 30s and my counterparts um, had lived through that terrible period. And um, it was certainly a, a feature of the culture in this part of Uganda that was very fresh in people's memories. Um, the scene that I came upon and where I've worked now since that time um, looks like this, and this is the hospital that was um, founded by um, an Irish missionary, Ian Clark, who um, uh, worked with Church of Uganda, which is Uganda's branch of Church of England, with the local population to stabilize things and address the serious and, and often emergent health needs of the local population. And um, when I started working there, it was in consultation with a development organization which had been charged by the First Lady, Janet Museveni, with coming into this district and helping this hospital in particular to address the very high maternal and infant mortality rates. So in addition to these fresh memories of this genocidal period that the local people had lived through, they were also you know, experiencing, like people in many historical and contemporary low resource settings, that heavy burden of infant and maternal mortality. And so um, at that time, this, the maternity unit looked like this here that you can see in this picture and was usually dark at night. There wasn't electricity. And so deliveries, which often happened at night, were um, done by lantern light. And um, the mortality rate was absolutely staggering for both mothers and children. And so the clinicians in this setting, the first call that they put to the organization that I was working with was, would you please focus your attentions on this very serious problem that we're dealing with here, which was um, these um, death rates in the infant and maternal populations. And so one of the first things that we set about doing was connecting the clinicians locally with clinicians in 11 different Seattle area hospitals, including Seattle Children's Hospital and UW, um, to train people on site in Uganda and bring some of those clinicians here to, the, to America to be trained in um, in the Seattle area. And this is the unit that was built um, out of the generosity of many different donors and um, government um, money over um, the next, um, so we began the construction of this unit in 2003, I think. And um, now it's an absolutely amazing and beautiful, almost spaceship-like environment for the local people who live in very simple circumstances at home in very modest homes that you would have seen pictured in my first slide. And you know, one of the things that I think about a lot when I'm thinking about the practical challenges facing the unit is that in, in many ways, the clinicians have become hardened to this, um, this, the regularity of death um, in these very vulnerable and very tiny babies and um, sometimes also their mothers. And it reminds me of some of the more, um, I think coarse ways that people in other countries might talk about Ugandans and their, um, their ability to deal with the, the high death rate of their children, uh, imagining that they don't really care. And it's not that they don't care, it's that the, the frequency and the regularity with which they're forced to contend with the passing of their children has um, changed their, their coping strategies. And what we're seeing on the unit is that the clinicians themselves are going through sort of waves of ability to cope with the um, uh, different rates of mortality that they're experiencing on the unit. And I'd like to talk about that um, in a few minutes. So at this point in time, the um, mortality rate in the unit is, um, is actually increasing. And this is after a period of almost 15 years where the mortality rate of these little um, children and, and some of them very sick babies had gone way down. 
So what happened was initially when the training um, and equipment, medicine, and supplies were brought into the unit, what was um, happening for the clinicians is that they were um, emboldened by and, and, and their spirits were buoyed by the reality that way more babies were surviving than ever before because they had the capacity to um, deliver life-saving, sometimes um, very simple and very inexpensive, but critical life-saving um, uh, interventions. And then what happened as time went by is that the clinician's expertise increased, and that meant the, the acuity of the, of the conditions that the patients were being admitted with was going up, and that the expectations of the clinicians of their own ability to save those, those babies was also still very high. But in reality, they were losing more and more of them because of the, the seriousness of, the, of their condition when they were admitted to the unit. And so what we have witnessed now is between maternity and NICU is a reluctance for mortality to happen on your spreadsheet. So if a baby is born in, in maternity that the clinicians in that unit believe is not going to survive, they will hasten that child over to NICU so that the death will occur on that unit. Because you can imagine how morale busting it is when you see your mortality rate go up in your patients. And the experience of that is terrible for those people, especially because as time has gone on, their own expectations of themselves has increased. So um, I want to talk about a concept which is in the Luganda language called okukugubaga, and it's a mouthful. And um, what it, it, it uh, directly translates to in English is mourning, but in real life what it refers to is the extended period of that state of liminality that I referred to before, during which certain things are supposed to happen in that culture. So as they understand it, grief itself, is it, it puts a person in a liminal state because you're caught between worlds. And I like to think of that in terms of um, some of the phrases that we use in our culture just to describe people, or in, in phrases that will be familiar to many people here, um, in, in describing people who are grieving. Phrases like, she was out of her mind with grief, or uh, he was beside himself with grief, that indicate that you've somehow sort of physically left your body or your mind because the, the burden upon um, yourself is too heavy. So in Uganda, the, the understanding expression and expression of grief is similar. It's understood to be, to put you into a, 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 a transitional zone where you're caught between the world of the living and the world of um, spirits. And the way that people express themselves during that time is very particular and very specific. Um, the most um, noticeable uh, expression of grief is during the funerary rites, which can take three to five days typically, but under certain circumstances can last as long as a month. And so the, um, the uh, expression of grief during that time is brief, it's intensive, and abnormal behavior is tolerated. And that typically takes the form of excessive drinking of alcohol and expressions of sexuality in ways that are not considered to be appropriate outside of that period. Um, that grief period or mourning period also ends abruptly, and after that time, it's considered to be inappropriate to express grief um, in a public way, um, even among your relatives. So the death of neonates and infants is the focus of my work, and the fact of the matter is that clinicians in the unit are getting fatigued, and it's leading to high turnover. And so the hospital administrators have asked for help to help the clinicians deal with the variety of different um, cultures that are represented in the patient population and the difference that the uh, clinicians themselves, who are mostly elite urban Ugandans who've come to this rural place to practice uh, medicine, to help them understand how they can cope with their own um, mental and emotional um, state as they're experiencing the grief that they themselves are feeling, but also coping with the grief that the parents are feeling themselves um, uh, on the patient end. So in Uganda, grief is very calibrated specifically to characteristics of the person who died. So um, when uh, that mourning period occurs, the amount of cash that's brought or food that's brought to, to feed the mourning people 
is um, it depends on characteristics of the person who died. So somebody who's very, very young is considered to be less of a loss than somebody who's in their prime of life. And somebody who's very, very old is considered to have lived, um, you know, or hoped to have lived a good life and come to the end of it. And so grieving for individuals like the elderly and grieving for individuals like the very young is calibrated at a lower sort of, um, uh, amount than, um, than people who die in the prime of their life. And Ugandans are very uh, candid and explicit about that reality. Um, the death of, of neonates and infants, by contrast to the death of somebody in the prime of their life, is considered to be problematic. Now, the two uh, Lugandan words that are used to refer to children who die at very young ages are impuna and, and ikintu. And the um, direct translation of those terms is the thing. And this helps us understand that infants themselves are not believed to be fully among the living because they themselves are liminal. Therefore, their deaths are considered to be actually dangerous to the people who are around them when they die, um, who may be exposed to an unpredictable and potentially harmful spirit world. And so you can imagine the conflict that that places the clinicians in because they have absorbed um, some of the, through their trainings in North America and through their exposure to, um, you know, the traditions observed by people in other cultures and expectations of survivability of, of infants, et cetera, they themselves believe that the infants um, that, the, that they're caring for in the unit should be surviving. And so in the NICU, they're spending an extended time in this liminal state, and that um, sort of increases the likelihood that um, the clinicians who are helping them or the family members that are supporting them are in contact with this very dangerous spirit world. So another uh, element that enters into the um, sort of equation is that blame and retribution creep in. The, beth the death itself of the infant can be considered to be suspicious. Either the mother delayed care for herself or the infant, or she may, have, she may be regarded to have taken steps to um, cause a miscarriage to happen because of um, a disagreement between herself and her husband over how many children um, is appropriate for their family, et cetera. And those are very taboo in this culture. The clinicians may blame themselves for being insufficient, and that is um, a heavy weight that they um, that they bear, especially in this setting. So we have this combination of escalated emotion, plus the spirit world focus of people who are coping with death and seeing death on a regular basis around them at work, and um, plus the inappropriateness of expressions of grief and mourning outside of the proscribed period. And what that's leading to is the, the phenomenon of compassion fatigue where the clinicians themselves are finding that they're incapable of rolling with it. They can't come to work, they can't keep their spirits up, they can't continue to function as effectively as they used to. And this is by no means unique to the Ugandan setting. Um, compassion fatigue is well known in the nursing and clinical communities in our country as well. Um, but there seems to be a unique challenge here uh, for these clinicians, in part because they are um, not included in any of the um, funerary rites that might be observed by the more modern parents who come in and consider the infant deaths as deaths that should be observed with um, proper displays of grief and mourning and funerary rites, and, um, and also a lacking uh, support system or therapeutic tradition that is appropriate to this particular cultural setting. So that's sort of part two of my uh, thoughts on this, is what happens next, what sort of interventions might be appropriate, and how do we translate ideas about therapy, emotional and mental support for people in different cultures appropriately. Um, but I think it would be best for me to handle that during the question and answer period, because I don't want to take up too much more of my time. Thank you. Um. So when you walk on the streets in North India uh, and you'll often pass a funeral procession of people walking, carrying a body open uh, on an open bier to the cremation ground, and usually they are continuously chanting these two lines, Ram Nam Satya Hai, Satya Bolo Gatya Hai. Now Ram is the name of the divine which pervades all things and is also beyond all things. So the first line means Ram's name is real. 
And the second line means, the truth is that the real is always going. In the Gita, Krishna says, I am, I am of the entire universe, the coming forth into being as well as the going forth into cosmic absorption. So in Hindu philosophy, the understanding of existence and of divinity is dynamic. There isn't one creation of the world and one destruction of the world or one birth or death for an individual, and that includes all beings, but endless cycles of birth, death, and rebirth, both of individual beings and of worlds. Um, also, the understanding is that everyone and everything is in the process of constantly dying and constantly being reborn. Rebirth is a fundamental Indic civilizational ideal. Uh, idea. It is common to Hinduism and to the three other Indic religions that grew out of Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism in the 6th century BC and Sikhism in the 15th century AD. Most Hindus cremate bodies and put the ashes in a river. And this again expresses this dynamic nature of reality, the idea that all things are like rivers which meet in the ocean of existence and as the water evaporates and comes back in the form of rain, after death there is rebirth. So uh, how does the idea of rebirth affect grief is something I'm working on or interested in. Uh, for one thing, people think about what will it mean to re-meet somebody whom you love. On the one hand, everyone is supposed to desire liberation from the endless cycle of rebirth. But on the other hand, I found that people do also look forward to meeting again in another form. Uh, there are serious stories about this. There are also funny stories about this. Um, many lovers, spouses, close friends believe that they will be reborn together, either in the same relationship or some other very close relationship to one another. Uh, I was talking to a friend who was mourning an aunt who was like a second mother to her, and I said that you will meet in another birth. And she said, yes, but she won't be the same, and I won't remember her or recognize her, uh, which is true. But what one is supposed to be able to look forward to is an inexplicable sense of connection, uh, which means that both people will change in many ways, maybe in every way. So gender will change, class, physical appearance, sexual orientation, race, nationality, even species may change from one lifetime to the next. Um, but what doesn't change in Hindu belief are attachments, because attachments cause one to be reborn. So the general belief is that any strong and inexplicable liking or aversion that one feels to a person, a place, a thing, or an activity is because of a connection in a former life. And from ancient times to the present, a very common Indic explanation for a sense of immediate connection with someone is that you were connected in a former lifetime. Uh, I found this in texts as old as 500 BC, and I've heard many Indians today, including some Indian Muslims, uh, say this semi-seriously, semi-playfully. Uh, for instance, a friend of mine who's a gay man said uh, in an interview, um, if I'm born again, uh, if I were to believe in rebirth, uh, I want to be reborn as a gay man. Um, here's a funny story. A friend of my grandfather's had a beautiful and intelligent golden retriever. And once while petting it, he said, hurry up, hurry up, meaning hurry up and be reborn as a human. Um, another, friend of, another friend of mine who lost her 27-year-old brother, he was a pioneering gay activist, and she lost him to Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, she deliberately had a third child, which, whom she hadn't planned to have, but then she decided to have, because she hoped that her brother would be reborn as her child. Uh, and interestingly, the son of hers strongly resembles her brother. Uh, in photographs which I have shown to close friends of her brother, they've mistaken the son for the brother. Um, of course, that doesn't mean she doesn't grieve for her brother, she still grieves for her brother um, uh, 30 years later. Um, so to talking about rituals around death, traditionally Hindus and also many Muslims and Christians in India don't light the cooking fire in the house in the days following a death. So friends and neighbors bring the food for the mourners. Everyone who visits removes the shoes at the door and sits together on the ground on a white cloth. White is the color of mourning, traditionally also worn by all mourners. Um, in different parts of the country, the mourning continues from four days to 10 days to 13 days, depending on the community. And on the concluding day, a worship ceremony is held, held and everyone is fed. And also the poor are fed and animals are fed. Um, among Hindus, when a person is dying, he or she is taken off the bed and placed on the floor. The idea is you're going back to the earth. Uh, and a spoon of water from the river Ganga is put in the mouth. The name of a god or goddess is chanted continually. The idea being, which is in the Gita too, that whatever one remembers at the moment of death is what one goes to. So if one hears and focuses on the, divinity, on the divine, one may be liberated and merge with uh, that divine self. That's the hope at least. Uh, at the cremation, the oldest son, these days it's often a daughter, it can be a daughter too, conducts the ceremonies instructed by a priest. 
he or she walks around the body three times holding a water pot and then smashes it. And that signifies the body breaking. Uh, in some communities, once the pyre is set alight, the sun also smashes the head with an iron rod. Otherwise, the skull may not burn. The, the inside of the skull may not burn. These days, of course, many cremations are electric, so that's not done. Uh, family members then usually take the ashes to the Ganga. Or you can go to any river, but many people go to the Ganga, what is called Ganges in the West. Uh, they go to one of the many pilgrimage places that are along the course of the river. And when they immerse the ashes, the chief mourner, wearing only one piece of cloth wrapped around them, walks into the river as far as they can without swimming. Uh, a friend of mine who did this for her father, she told me this experience felt tremendously freeing. She felt the grief wash out of her, and also the feeling of the rushing water is, of course, that feeling of going, of constant departure. Uh, Hindus also worship ancestors. Once a year on the death anniversary of one's parents, one undertakes a worship ceremony, and you offer, part of it is offering rice balls to crows, to dogs, to cows. Uh, this is done in the name of the dead person, but it's also an offering to the dead person as well as to all ancestors. So a friend of mine who teaches, who is a Hindu, but teaches Indian philosophy in Hawaii, he was performing the ceremony for his father. And he asked the priest, what is the point of this? My father would either have been reborn or gone to a temporary heaven. Hindus believe in a temporary, temporary heavens or would have been liberated. So he won't be there to receive these offerings. So why are we doing it? The priest replied, it's not for your father, it's for you. Uh, lay people like to feel that it's for their father or their parents, but it's actually for the living to feel that connection with those who have gone and to express gratitude and to recover from grief. Um, so it's customary in Hindu homes to keep photographs of dead parents in the house and to garland them with flowers, just the way the pictures and the images of the gods and goddesses are garlanded. Uh, many also keep the photographs in their worship shrines like permanently along with the gods and goddesses. Uh, this is because in Hindu belief, everything that exists is a manifestation of the divine. But parents and teachers are specially worshipped as the divine, which are manifested in our lives. Because they gave us, parents gave us life, and then teachers, parents and teachers gave us knowledge, which is a second life, it's a second birth. Um, there are also, I should say, several ancient Hindu texts, which are very well-known stories, about individuals talking to the god of death and sometimes debating with him and tricking him. The god of death is supposed to come and fetch the dead person away. A famous one is that of a woman, Savitri, who follows the god of death to get back her husband. And just to get rid of her because she's bothering him, he gives her three boons. So she uses the two first boons for her parents-in-law for something that they need. One of them is blind and she gets his eyes back. The final boon she asks for is a hundred sons. And without thinking about it, he has, of course, given her these boons. So now she wants a hundred sons. Then, of course, he has to return her husband because without the husband, how is she going to have the sons? So... I'll conclude with a very, uh, so these, I said these stories are well known and people play all sorts of variations on them. Uh, I'll conclude with a very funny commercial I saw recently. It doesn't have English subtitles, so I would have shown it. Uh, the God of Death comes to take an elderly lady and he's quite cross because he's doing night duty and he's really tired and he says, hurry up and get your slippers and what are you doing? And he puts, he it anticipates it by putting a garland on a picture of hers, which is on the wall. Uh, but then to refresh him, she says, okay, you're so tired. Why don't you have these sweets and savories which she has prepared with a particular brand of ghee. Ghee is clarified butter used in cooking. Uh, so he enjoys it very much and he says, will you cook it in heaven for me? Because the heavenly nymphs know how to dance, but they don't know how to cook. So she says, <laughs> see, she, she asks, is this brand of ghee available in heaven? And he says, no. Then she says, okay, then I can't cook. Then he says, then stay where you are. I'll keep coming and going. So um, I guess I have a, I'm going to present something that's a little roundabout, I got to say. And it's, it's actually, an ex uh, let's just put it this way. I'm going to talk about my experience as an Indonesian going through the public school system in Indonesia. right? And we'll see how this plays out as, as I go on. But... To officially begin uh, this, I guess my remarks, that's the official way to put it, I'll, I'll read by, I'll read from this book, like, uh, just two paragraphs from this book, it's called Indonesia, Etc. It's by Elizabeth Pisani, and she's a journalist who traveled in Indonesia for a little bit, and she has a really funny anecdotes in the book, and this is one that she opens with in the prologue, right? Okay. Miss, come in and meet my granny. The invitation came some 20 years ago from a smiling young man who had spotted me tramping along a dirt road in the obscure southeastern Indonesian island of Sumba. It was skillet hot and ashtray dusty, and I was very thirsty. His granny probably had tales to tell, 
And she'd certainly be good for a glass of tea or two. Why not? I'd clambered up the ladder onto a bamboo veranda where other youngsters were making unrestful noises with gongs and drums, then ducked through the low doorway and blinked into a windowless darkness. Eventually, by the tiny grains of light that sprinkled through the bamboo weave of the walls, I made out a poster of Jesus and a sacred heart. And there was a bag of dirty laundry on a bamboo chair. But the room was otherwise deserted. There's no sign of granny. Just a second, the young man fiddled around with the laundry bag, untying it and peeling it back. The napkin on top, peeling back the napkin on top to reveal granny. She had died the previous day and would be receiving guests each day until her funeral four days later, as was the local custom. It's an honor for her to meet you, he said. And we sat and drank tea. Okay. So Indonesia is, is full right, of a variety of these interesting death practices not, you know, from the external point of view. Uh, as she mentions, this includes, for example, the ceremony of the Tarajans, people in the South Sulawesi, who change the clothes of their dead every three years. Right? They're, they're mummified, just to, to clarify. Mummified dead every three years, and also uh, the practices of the Balinese, who wash and cremate the bodies publicly in um, funeral pyres. Right? But I'm not really interested in sort of sharing these particular stories. One, because I'm no expert on the intricacies of these death and dying practices. Uh, but I am interested in sort of thinking through my own experience of how I knew about these practices at a very young age, right? And the, the easy answer to that is that it's through national education. But then the more interesting question is like, why through national education do we have exposure to these death practices? Right? And this has to do with the history of Indonesia. And to frame this, I want to sort of go back to granny, right? that we met and had tea with, sort of vicariously, uh, with Pisani. And the question here is like, how did it come to be, right, that Indonesia, that Indonesia, we can have a traditional death practice coexisting with a world religion, Catholicism in this case, as represented by Jesus and the Sacred Heart on the wall, uh, within a modern nation that houses the largest Muslim population in the world, right? How did this come about, right? And so I'll take a moment to sort of explain Indonesian history and then tie it back to this whole story of how this has come to be and my experience of it. Right. So Indonesia as a nation is made up of 13,000 plus islands, depending on low tide and high tide, you know, where you count. Uh, it's inhabited by people from over 360 ethnic groups who speak between them 719 languages. Right. And so this is astounding. How do you, first of all, unite a nation of such diversity, and second, ensure the continuance of this unity? Right? The first question is fairly easy to answer as well. Uh, the impetus for unity is to resist and to gain independence from the Dutch colonizers. Right? So that's easy enough. You have a common enemy. Yada, yada. Uh, the second question is more difficult. Right? So how do you ensure the continuance of this unity after you have gained independence? And it is, I think, to the credit of the founding architects of Indonesia um, that they charted a pretty good path forward right, for the nation even prior to official independence. And they charted this path forward largely by articulating a vision of national identity that was secular and predicated on diversity, pluralism, moderation, and tolerance. And this is evidence in the national motto, which is Pineka Tungal Ika which means university, unity in diversity. I keep on saying university for some reason, but as I was rehearsing too. But unity, unity in diversity, and two, in the choice of national language, which they adopted from a trade language instead of one of the 719 ethnic languages. So that sort of equalizes and sort of promotes this sort of notion of plurality and diversity. And thirdly, in the Panchasila, right, the five guiding principles of the nation. And I don't, I think I have time to go through all five of them. So I'll mention the first one, which is belief in the almighty God. Right? And this, under this belief, you kind of have five, six, depending on your interpretation of Christianity, official religions. So you have here 
Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam, and Protestant Christianity and Catholic Christianity, if you want to put it that way. So as part of the national identity of Indonesia, right, crucial to it is this notion of diversity, and including that is cultural diversity, right? And that is translated, I mean, it doesn't play well on the ground a lot. Right? It, these parts kind of like clash in, in reality, as with any sort of guiding ideal principle. But for the most part, they translate, people you know, take it up as a national identity, and it's translated through civic education in public schools. And so as part of the civic education, as what I experienced, when I was going through an elementary school, it's called PPKN. Now I think it's PKN. I don't know if anyone could clarify that here. Uh, but as part of that, I remember having to learn about the religious practices of Muslims, of Hindus, of Buddhists, of Chinese Indonesians. I don't want to say Confucians. It's, it's a little amended there. Um, but also multiple cultural practices and cultural groups of Indonesia that make up Indonesia, right? So I'd learn about um, the Balinese. I'd learn about tribes in Papua. I'd learn about Minangkabau, et cetera, et cetera, right? And part of this, you have to learn about their death practices, right? It's sort of like an external side effect of this national identity predicated on diversity, right? So that is sort of what I realized as I was thinking about how it is that I came to at a very young age, as a uh, like nine-year-old, knowing about some of the interesting death practices around Indonesia, and it has to do with national education. And so I guess what I would like to leave you with, and I'll conclude with this, is to think about what is the role of education in death literacy. And it doesn't have to be about a plurality of death practices, right? But it could also be about how do we cope with, how do we process dying, how do we do grief, you know, how do we have a more communal um, element to it, and how do we, how can we translate it into schools, and what is the, yeah, how do we translate it through education via whatever mode? Okay, that's it. Thank you. One of the big goals of this panel was to put on display the great diversity of ideas and practices and approaches that are right here in our community, but then also to open up to global context. So um, now as members of the community, it's your time to uh, ask questions. Does anyone have a, a question that they want to pose to one of the panelists or uh, should we let them talk to one another? What, any, yeah, okay, there I see one. Um, I guess I have more of a comment than a question. Um, just going back to your question about when does morning end, hearing all of you talk, it almost sounds like does it ever really end? I mean, there seems to be many areas where we keep, we bring food to family members on the anniversary of their deaths. Um, do you think there's a difference between mourning and commemoration, or is it kind of always come back? I think there are stages of mourning. There's grieving, there's mourning, there's perspective, and there's the stages of mourning that's not original. You know, it's been a lot of research on that. And there's healing and there's remembering, there's placement of what we go through. So the most intense is when the loss first happens. And I think it's interesting to have an actual ending time, the Ugandan tradition, the custom. Like, that's it, you're done. Uh, in Judaism, like at the seven-day mark, you do have to get up. There's a custom of walking to the corner. You're supposed to leave your house and walk whatever it means to the end of your street because you're going back into the world. So there are markers and ritual paradigms to move us along in the morning. Not sure that answers it, but that's part something. <laughs> I'll comment briefly too. Uh, yes, and in our in our belief, there's a there has to be an official end because there's work that needs to be done in the community, and in the old way, we, we didn't have time to sit and cry around for too long. There was work that needed to get completed. So, um, in how that translates into today is if someone does not um, go through this morning process correctly, then they they can make themselves both mentally and physically ill in that way. And it is explanatory in some 
in the eyes of the community when we see a person who has died and the family who didn't exactly do the, the steps they needed to do for their mourning, it's explanatory why they continue to have this propagation of illness or misfortune in their lives. So mourning is, you know, it's an English word and it's hard to, to translate it into, into a cultural context, but I get, I get your idea, yeah, there, the dead is always remembered in some way but the actual mourning to allow yourself to be sad and to, to be pitiful and to cry, that has to end at some point because the life has to keep going on for that person. In the, I guess for lack of a better term, the dominant culture in our country, um, we don't have these you know common rituals around the death. Maybe the closest thing is if you belong to a church or a, a, a subculture, but the dominant culture doesn't have it. And... It's almost like when somebody dies, um, it's left up to individuals to deal with it, and then you don't really talk about it in public. So my my wonderment is alongside that, <clears throat> excuse me, we also have this heavy emphasis on individualism, and we think we, you know, uh, consider the worth of every individual per so, person so highly, and yet when they die, there's not a community or a cultural tradition to, to celebrate and, and to mourn that person. It's all left up to sort of individuals. And I'm just wondering how that happened. I know that we've had, you know, the funeral industry came up and professionalized that part, but somehow we've lost a, a more community approach to dealing with somebody who's passed on and respecting them in an ongoing way as an individual who's, who's gone. I'll comment briefly on that as well. So I can we see this uh, this uh, transition happening um, amongst our our community right now, where um, two three generations ago the the um, ceremonialism was very strong, and um, because we had older people who who lived in that time period. But as we progress a few generations forward, because of uh, um, assimilative forces, uh, that um, those particular ceremonies are, are dying off because they're very difficult to do. <clears throat> they take a lot of work. They take a lot of a, a commitment. Even in the even in the lowest form of expressing those is very difficult. So it's partly I can see it in in our community. It's partly just being lazy and not understanding. More importantly, not understanding why that has to be done. That and it's going to translate into some good fortune for you if you do this. Where it just it just seems like a labor, like, okay, well, we have to do this. Why, why are we even doing this? So sometimes we're our own worst enemies because we think way too practically and say, well, why are we doing this? We don't need to do it, but if we place it back in a spiritual, cultural context, it's very, very important, and it's the matter of life and death or fortune for someone moving forward. So that transition you're talking about kind of struck me because I can see that from my being a young child, seeing this very strong, strong uh, grieving and funeral process to today where our elders are just, they, they're beside themselves because nobody's following through with those old ways. Yeah, I think it's interesting that uh, <clears throat> uh, how we deal with death and dying in, in our culture in American society. Um, there's a lot of push right now to, to end of death conversations. Like we really don't talk about it. Uh, we. People don't really talk about their finances at the end of their lives. Nobody wants to bring it up. And then there's chaos afterwards, uh, pre-planning. The number of people pre-plan, the percentage is so low. It's, you know, people don't want to prepare. They don't want to think about it too much. As a rabbi, the number of times I get the question of, well, should my child go to the funeral? This is a 10-year-old or a 9-year-old. Should I, you know, because we, we have to keep that from them. And I've gotten that question more than I used to years ago. And the other question is, well, what are we supposed to do? To me, though, let, you know, kids can watch murder scenes and destruction and people dying on the movie screen or in games, but we're not going to get too close to death. So I think that's part of what's happened as well. Mm -hmm. We want to keep away from that in American culture. Um, something I found interesting about listening to everyone was the, the similarities and the commonalities in terms of death rituals globally and culture, the cross-culture. 
and the, and the differences. You know, so we sat down next to each other and said, "Wow, both of our cultures watch the body." You know, it's uh, so there are similarities and differences. That's something that I found enlightening. Uh, listening to everyone. I was just going to comment that I, th I think I heard more similarities than, than differences yeah. uh, on the panel, and I think that's because people have figured out what works. Um, and there are the, the, the things that are similar across the different cultural um, expressions of grief that we've heard about today are, are probably worth paying attention to. And I think the, you know, what's happening in the circumstances that I described has been sort of a, an accelerated uh, transition through what you've described happening in American culture where it's not possible for the clinicians to participate in Okuku Bugaga to their detriment and they're feeling it and now it's become a practical and hopefully solvable problem with some interventions so that they can retain these highly trained staff and you know keep functioning in these you know amazing units on maternity and, and NICU wards, but um, the, the, the very real challenge now is figuring out how to reinstate that in a fashion that's appropriate in that setting because traditionally in the villages in, in Uganda, what um, would be considered to be appropriate behavior in communicating with the spirit world or, or sort of bridging that divide between the world of the living and the world of the spirits is verboten on a hospital campus of a, of a religious hospital. So expressions of Christianity and religiosity in the Christian faith um, prohibit any verging over into animistic or traditional religious belief systems, or you know, certainly communicating with the spirit world would be considered to be very inappropriate and, and very dangerous. So, um, it, it's a real challenge, and I suppose it, it's a challenge that maybe we as a mainstream American culture are facing in the exact same way that these um, folks in these uh, two units are. Sure, I guess, I, I guess I'll just take on maybe a more philosophical <laughs> read on things. Uh, it seems to me and this is happening around the world with sort of, you know, exportation of cultures and also the ways we do things, commodification and whatnot. But we have lost a sense of transformations or like how things are transformed to other things, right? For example, we don't even see for the most part where meat comes from and that involves death. We don't necessarily are, we're not aware of uh, how food comes to be and how it's harvested and what goes into that, that cycle, right? And you know, I think to me that sort of obscuring is part and parcel of the, the individualism and the aversion, right, to sort of reckoning or having even a communal sort of focal practice uh, around, around death and dying because it, it requires a transformation that you don't see. You don't see that link necessarily. Um, and it, it, it's just, yeah, it's, it's something that you've, you don't really understand, I guess. I don't know how to put it, but that's sort of my understanding of it. And just to root it in my experience in Indonesia, you know, I'd be walking around and I'd see chickens just <laughs> hanging out and I know where they're going and I know what's going to happen to them. And you can go to the back and you, you learn how to slaughter them. Or even public practices of death, right? In, the, uh, in Indonesia and in, in Java, Japanese Muslims, they, they do also have a procession and that's public and you know I'd be coming home from school in a little minibus angkot <laughs> and I'd, we'd have to stop and let the, the procession pass um, but I think that's because there's some attunement to what happens in the moment of transition there for me at least yeah hi um, the question I had kind of leads into what you guys were just talking about this idea of I guess uh, that humans like to ignore or not think about death. And um, one theme I noticed tonight is we talked about, about bereavement, um, but I was curious if anyone had any thoughts about dealing with our own eventual mortality, uh, thinking about that individually and the difficulty with that. Um, I mentioned the uh, Jewish 
Holy Day, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that day, on that day, we actually reenact or imagine that we're dying, that we die and come back to life. So it's a day when we fast. We don't eat that day. Um, it's, uh, we don't engage in intimacy. You know, we really focus on the internal, in, internal aspects of who we are so we can transform and become better people. And literally part of us dies, the bad part, the things we've done wrong die off, and we can come back to life as new people, as a better person. So there are moments when we can imagine our demise, that our, our own deaths. And in some ways, if we can do that, then each moment of life is precious. You can't do it all the time. You go crazy. But can you, at certain times, say, hmm, what if this was my last moment? How would I live life? And Judaism does have moments of that throughout the year, but especially on Yom Kippur. And if, I, if this is my final moment, you know, live each day as if it's your last, or you know, imagine being on the brink of the end and a new beginning. So Judaism has that religious tradition practice to you know, empower one to live fully. Thank you. I, I also think that's why the arts are so fundamental uh, across societies and, and so um, inarguably central to human existence because they help us to rehearse for death and they allow us a cathartic experience of it. And I also think that's why live theater is so, so fundamentally important as an art form, because we get to see a living body and share in the space and breathe with them um, as they perform a, a kind of a ritual of death for us. And I think that's a feature across the theater canon, across uh, cultures, um, from uh, uh, across global theater forms. Um, and it's something I think too that contemporary theater can really take up the challenge to help us to um, again to in a in a contemporary context, not just the historical text, not just the canonical text, um, but the the contemporary text can help us to reframe that a little bit. Um, one of the reasons I think though the canonical texts are so powerful is because they they are written from a time when death was so visible, back to the chickens, right? Um, when uh, life and death was part of the everyday world. And one of the real challenges in training actors to um, prepare uh, for performing a role in Shakespeare, for example, is to help them to uh, try to embody that sense of openness and of constant risk. So in, in Shakespeare, if you're performing Shakespeare, you can't hide. You have to really be live and in the moment and present and engage actively with the audience. And for a, con a, a contemporary 21st century Western actor, that can be a kind of a scary challenge. Um, uh, but again, I think that this is why we have to continue to, um, to, to keep the arts central across cultures in our lives. So wonderful question. Um, uh, the um, Buddhist tradition, uh, as I mentioned, focuses a lot on contemplation of death. And in fact, um, there's a, uh, a practice that can be done, uh, you know, as a practitioner wishes, but uh, often daily uh, to contemplate the fact that we will eventually become sick if we are not right now. We'll eventually age uh, if we are lucky to live that long. And uh, we will die. And to really uh, remember that as a way of, um, as uh, Mark was saying, to... Uh, bring ourselves into the into the present moment and it becomes death in that way of of looking at our life now becomes rather than a a question of why or why me uh, it becomes a question of what now uh, because we are going to die uh, so what now what are you going to do now uh, with that understanding and with that uh, knowledge and with that living. It made me think of um, the question of um, uh, earlier, too, about being uh, the fact that we don't talk about death and dying and that it is kind of put away from us. There's a fear uh, around that. Uh, so it's a, it's a um, confronting that fear 
as a way of um, being able to be more alive uh, in the present. Uh, when my children were very young and I would put them to bed, uh, you know, they were in that range of um, SIDS. And I didn't know if I was going to see them in the morning. And that was a very powerful uh, experience for me uh, to put them to bed and to also be able to sleep. Uh, it could have brought up terror and panic, uh, but I used it rather as a way of um, being as fully present and loving them in that moment, and then so happy in the morning. Hi, my name is Lawrence. Thank you all for um, what you're offering to us this, this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm reminded uh, here towards the end of this uh, discussion of what seems to me to be a general in the, in the dominant culture, as someone brought up earlier, a general intolerance of endings of any kind. Um, and I think that informs this question that, that has come up um, with, with dying and with grief. Grief is really playing a, a pretty important part here. There seem to be a lot of interest in that question. Um, part of the reason I have this microphone in my hand is because I'm hosting some of the other Festival of Remembrance events that are coming up. Um, the first one will be on the, the 30th of October at the Roxy Theater, and it's a screening of a film called Grief Walker. Um, no, it's the 29th, not the 30th. I keep getting this wrong. The 29th will be that screening, and then the following night, I'm going to do a reading um, of an essay called Between Home and Hell. And it's kind of connected a little bit with um, the Irish presentation, um, looking at some of the traditions from the Nordic uh, custom, but in a very uh, particular context, having to do with an effort that a group of people are making to um, connect with the dead through a song, and a kind of an invocation, you could say. And the question that, that uh, comes up in this essay is, uh, do we really have any business trying to do something, practice a tradition that we really don't know anything about? You know, you know like, well, what if they really were to show up kind of question. Yeah. Um, the third event is in, is in November and is called um, A Night of Grief and Mystery, Missoula, which will be a spoken word event with uh, music. Um, the storyteller, Stephen Jenkinson, will be talking, uh, telling stories of his experiences um, working in what he refers to as the death trade. And um, the musicians will be accompanying him, kind of creating an ambient um, mood and occasional actual songs that uh, work with the theme. So, um, you know, back to this question about grief. I, I wonder how it is that we, these two subjects just seem to have to go together. We talk about grief and dying both. And I also, um, I guess I'd like to raise a question. Um, does grief, if, if, we were, if we were more tolerant of endings, it seems that it would call for us to cultivate more skill around grieving. And that's a question that I, that I have. Um, is, is that a possibility for us to, to get better at grief um, instead of um, thinking of it as an affliction that we have to get on the other side of. I guess it's an American um, mantra to get better at everything. Yeah. But honestly, I don't think one can get better at grief. It, a real grief overwhelms you. It's not a skill. It reminds me of uh, the Ecclesiastes. There's a time for everything. You know, it's turn, turn, turn. There's a time for being born. There's a time to die. There's a time to cry. And there's a time to laugh. So... There's a time to mourn. It's okay to cry. I mean, in the Middle East, they have like professional criers who show up, you know, yelping a cry at, at the uh, funeral. But there's a time for everything. And we, you know, we have to go through stages and we can mourn, but you can't mourn forever. Uh, it's, I, I, I can't imagine the pain and anguish of losing a child. 
but as a rabbi, I deal with that. And I, when people tr I use that, transform, they take that pain and they turn it into something helpful to others. To me, that is a miracle. You know, lose a child and then to create a fund and they help other children around the world. There's a time for, you know, dying and a time for living. My name is Erin Doherty, and um, 28 days ago, in about 40 minutes, my 19-year-old daughter died in a car wreck east of town. Um, so I'm still under the 30 days, but I'm getting to work as parents do, and uh, I, I need to see some change in our community with how we help each other get through this. Um, when the sheriff came to notify us that she had died, they hand you a pamphlet that is supposed to, you know, you'll read it the next day or a couple days later and it'll give you some guidance on what to do, who to call, um, to call the funeral home. I had, to, I had to call around to find my daughter's body because the information was wrong. Um, and then, and a lot of it is very... Christian based, not secular, uh, which, you know, kind of cracks my brain. It's not okay. That's not okay with me. On the back sheet of this pamphlet is a list of grief resources. And um, because I kept running into mistakes made by our, our system in helping people through this, I started calling all the, the list of all the grief resources. And um, Every one was wrong. There were six listed for, for families to call. One of them, that had never been the phone number of, of uh, this therapy group. Some of them didn't know how they got on the list. Um, one of the names of the organizations hadn't even been that in probably a decade. Uh, so apparently I'm the first person ever in all this time to call the sheriff's office and uh, ask for change. I'm going to be pressing for, for this to change. It's not okay to print out thousands of these pamphlets and continue to pass them out with no actual help, especially when we have a community that, that honors our losses every year with this, the Days of Remembrance, and that is grief and death informed. And so I, I think I'm speaking because um, I would like to reach out to some of you when it comes time to redo this pamphlet. And I think that's all I have to say. We need to change this. And I'm, it's helped me a lot to hear of what a lot of you have had to say as we're going through our process here, as we're getting ready for the wake. And, um, and also, thank you to this community that helped raise my beautiful daughter that, you know, we went to the, when it was called the Day of the Dead, we went most years. Greg was Rowan's and Ember's teacher, and he taught them mindfulness at community school. And, um, you know, we're going to love our way through this, and um, I'm grateful. I, uh, my soul is weeping with you. It's unimaginable loss, and you have my commitment to help make that change if I can be of help in any way. As a rabbi in the community, as part of UM Hillel, I will help you in any way I can. Okay, and uh, I am um, going to share a story of uh, uh, loss about two years ago that I had to deal with a family and a mother who lost her son, who was 29 years old, in a motorcycle accident. And uh, the grieving was horrible. And I sat with her. It was very sad. And she said, I will, how do I go on? I'll never be able to live again. And I said, our tradition asks us to try and see life in every possible way. I know it's painful and difficult. But we're all going to be here for each other. That's the power of community. Then when someone has a loss, they're not alone. And I saw her the next week, and then I saw her about a month later and still mourning, and then about two months later I saw her, and she said, I laughed for the first time, Rabbi. 
I never thought I would smile again. I'll never be the same. But Rabbi, I just want to be me. And I hope you'll know that life continues in that love. And then she told me the other thing about her son. So many people have come over to talk to me about my son. And I thought he was a pretty good kid. I never thought he had such impact in bringing love to other people's lives. And so I say, in my tradition, may the memory of your daughter always be a blessing and bring love to your life. Aaron, thank you for sharing that. I, that's a powerful moment to end a night like this and an evening like this. Um, it's why we gather, and, uh, and it's why we... Uh, stories like that in our communities that where we do need to make changes and we do need to be aware of what's going on uh, uh, in our community among our friends and family. We, we know grief touches every family. Um, there's no mustard seed uh, for any of us to give to uh, a grieving person. Um, thank you so much for coming. I want to end by thanking again our speakers for uh, sharing their wisdom with us.